Recently, I watched a testimonial video about a brother's experience of being an honest person. Seeing him take a close look at how he revealed crafty dispositions in lots of little ways was really moving for me. Mm. I noticed that I, too, do the same thing in my life, but I'd hardly reflected on it, and I lost many chances to gain the truth. Yeah. Mm. After that, I started to reflect on myself and realized I, too, showed a cunning disposition in many ways. Last year, I was watering new believers in the church. Meanwhile, I had to choose some people who could be cultivated and spend my time and energy on supporting them. That was something really tough for me. For one thing, I didn't know which people to train based on their actual situations and just arrogantly decided they weren't good enough. Plus, I thought it required lots of mental energy. I also felt like it was really taxing to do. In the end, I didn't train any newcomers. Later on, I found out some new believers didn't share much fellowship, and I wasn't sure of their understanding of God's words. I was thinking that to train them, to learn of their understanding, they needed one-on-one -on -one fellowship. Even then, I still might not know for sure, and it would take lots of time and energy. But if I didn't train them, my supervisor might say, I asked too much of them and didn't cultivate them, or that I was incompetent and couldn't get them trained. I was stuck and didn't know what to do. I felt like maybe I should ask my supervisor and let her decide. Then, if it didn't go well, I'd only bear part of the responsibility and would avoid being dealt with for my mistakes. So when I reached my supervisor, I wasn't direct about my lack of judgment and unsureness. Instead, I went on and on about those newcomers' situations and their struggles. So-and-so has poor internet and is hard to contact. So-and-so is busy with work. And so-and-so doesn't talk much in gatherings. But then, afraid she'd say I delimit others, I beat around the bush, saying, but they're active in gatherings and in their pursuit so I'll try my best to cultivate them. Oh, how did you respond? At first I thought she'd tell me what to do, say they weren't worth the effort to train. So it would be her decision, and I wouldn't be responsible or have to spend all that time on them. But I was pretty surprised when she didn't give me an answer, but just said sternly, listening to you always talk in circles is quite exhausting. What are you trying to say? Your reports of newcomers are always the same. You said they had certain problems, so it sounded like they weren't worth cultivating. And then you went ahead to say you'd do your best with them. I just simply can't tell what you actually think. Other people just say what they mean and to the point. But then you, why are you so indirect? How did you feel when she said that? Hmm. Well, I was pretty upset. I thought, when saying that, does she mean that I'm talking like a snake? Because the snake travels in zigzags and never in a straight line. Am I really that bad? At that time, I didn't know myself at all. I just suspected that maybe she had a bad day and was venting. I knew it was wrong to think that way. That she wouldn't say that just for no reason. That it must reflect her actual experience with me. God made her deal with me to let me learn a lesson. And I couldn't see my own corruption. So her pointing it out was helpful for me. Yes. Definitely. So I told her, I don't really see the problems you're describing, but I want to accept this and reflect on myself. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, I kept thinking of what she'd said to me, and I prayed and asked God to guide me to know myself. I remembered something in the Bible that Jehovah God asked Satan, From where come you? Satan responded, From going to and fro on the earth and walking around on it. Then I read God's analysis of Satan's answer. I'll read it.
All okay. right. So how then do you feel when you see Satan answering in this way? We feel that Satan is absurd and deceitful. Can you tell what I am feeling? I'm disgusted every time I see these words of Satan, as its words are empty. Did Satan answer God's question? Those words weren't an answer, yielded nothing, and didn't answer God's question. From going to and fro on the earth and walking around on it, what is your understanding of these words? Where does Satan come from? Have you gotten an answer? No. This is the genius of Satan's cunning schemes, not letting anyone know what it's actually saying. Hearing this, you still can't tell what it has said, though it's finished answering. Yet Satan believes it has answered perfectly. How then do you feel? Disgusted? Yes. Now you feel disgust for these words. Satan's words have a hallmark. They leave you scratching your head, unclear on their source. Sometimes Satan speaks purposely with motives, and sometimes, ruled by its nature, such words emerge naturally and come straight out of Satan's mouth. Satan does not spend a long time weighing such words, but rather, they are expressed without thinking. When God asked where it came from, it said a few cryptic words. You feel very puzzled and confused, never knowing exactly where Satan is from. Are there any among you who speak like this? What kind of way is this to speak? It is ambiguous and does not give a certain answer. What kind of words should we use to describe this way of speaking? It is diversionary and misleading, is it not? Suppose someone does not want to let others know what they did yesterday. You ask them, I saw you yesterday. Where were you going? They do not tell you directly where they went. They say, Yesterday was long, so tiring. Did they answer your question? They did, but not the answer you wanted. This is the genius within the artifice of man's speech. You can never discern what they mean, or their words' intention or source. You don't know what they're evading, as they have their own personal story in their heart. This is insidious. Are there any among you who also speak like this? Yes. What then is your purpose? Is it sometimes to protect your own interests? Sometimes to maintain your own pride, position, and image? To protect the secrets of your private life? Whatever the aim, it's linked to your personal interests. Is this not the nature of man? Amen. Amen. I saw from God's words that Satan always harbors tricks in its words, so to conceal its shameful intentions, it beats around the bush and equivocates. Yes. This is puzzling and confuses people. True. I realized I tended to speak with others the way Satan does, beating around the bush and confusing others. Like when they asked me how many newcomers were trainable in the church and also what their situations were. I could answer with a few simple sentences and describe how many there were. But I didn't just give a straightforward answer. I'd start out by talking about the newcomer's problems and give some reasons so others wouldn't think I wasn't focused on training newcomers, but that they were problematic and not worth it. Then after giving all those excuses, I changed my tune and wrapped up by saying that we needed to cultivate newcomers and I do my best with them. I talked for a while about how they were problematic, then said that I'd work on them. That wasn't a straightforward response, and was so snake-like, nobody knew what I meant. Yes, that is very indirect. Yes. Yeah. God says the reason Satan speaks indirectly, and always has motive and goal, is to protect its own interests. Then I asked myself, what purpose I had in mind by speaking that way to the others. Giving it careful thought, 
I saw I always started out talking about problems to avoid others thinking that I wasn't focused on cultivating new believers. But in reality, they weren't good candidates for various reasons. Then I'd end up saying that I'd stay on top of things and see, so that others would think I had a positive attitude and a burden for cultivating newcomers. Then they'd have no reason to say I was delimiting people and not willing to pay a price. I was really roundabout and had awful motives behind that. I didn't want to work hard on cultivation or have others think I lacked principles and tended to delimit people, not training them. And I was indirect, wanting others to guess what I meant, like a game, and decide if those new believers could be cultivated at all. So it would turn out well for me, no matter what. If anyone followed up on why I hadn't cultivated them, I could very easily blame it on the brothers and the sisters, saying they told me not to. If the newcomers did progress, then everyone would see that I could even cultivate such people. They'd think I was competent, and I'd look good. The way I spoke was exactly how God describes Satan's words, a zigzag, very snake-like, totally concealing my own motives and my own goals, so I could achieve my own aims without others knowing anything. I was just like Satan, insidious and crafty. Just like when asking my supervisor about which newcomers I should cultivate. I danced around things, mentioning a bunch of their problems, wanting her to decide for me. So if the newcomers weren't progressing, then it wouldn't be my fault. Instead, it would be on her shoulders. When I thought back on this, I realized my indirect approach seemed like I was asking for advice, but in fact, I was leading others to decide for me and wanted to evade responsibility. It was so insidious of me. Yeah, when we don't directly say what we mean, hmm. there's always some tricky motive behind it. Yeah, yes. Right. If a normal person asks questions, they simply just want to learn principles so they can do things in a principled way and better cultivate others to benefit the work of God's house. Hmm. But I wanted to evade my responsibility, to protect my own interests and reputation. How could I be so devious? The supervisor called me out that way because I was always being calculating and never showed any self-reflection. To God, this was disgusting. <sighs> Realizing that, I prayed and swore to God that from that moment on, I'd really think about my motives in speaking and practice honesty. Mm. Later, when others asked me about new believers, I wanted to start off with their problems again so they'd look unviable and I wouldn't be responsible. But when I realized I had the wrong motive and was being crafty, I consciously prayed, forsook myself, and talked about them fairly and objectively. Mm -hmm. But just a few days later, I was back to my old ways. One day, the supervisor said a new believer I'd watered was attending Sister Zhang's gatherings and told me that he liked her fellowship. After that, I thought to myself that the newcomer was arrogant, had lots of notions, and liked secular trends. He wasn't participating much in my gatherings, and watering him was really tiring so I figured I'd have less on my plate if Sister Zhang could water him. However, I was supposed to be the one watering him, so if I just transferred him to Sister Zhang, the supervisor might say I was being wily in my duty and wanted to hand off new believers who were hard to water. If the supervisor suggested transferring him, I could just naturally rid myself of that baggage. So, I asked her, a bit of a leading question about that newcomer preferring Sister Zhang's fellowship. She told me, yes. I then followed up, saying since that was the case, maybe we should go with what he liked. Anyway, he wasn't attending my gatherings regularly. I asked her what she thought. How did she react to that? Hmm. 
I was waiting for her to say he should be transferred. But she didn't decide right away. Later on, I felt a bit uneasy about it and a little guilty, thinking I was speaking with ulterior motives again. Why did I always have these shameful intentions? Why couldn't I just clearly and directly share my ideas and be up front that I didn't have a great impression of him, that he was too much trouble and I wanted him transferred? It would be a simple thing to say. And even if I had wrong intentions, at least they'd be honest words. Why couldn't I say that? After that, I looked for words from God relevant to my state, and found a passage. Almighty God says, Some people speak with a very confusing method. Sometimes their sentences have a beginning but no end. Sometimes an end but no beginning. You can't tell at all what they mean to say. Nothing they say makes any sense to you. And if you ask them to explain clearly, they don't. They often use pronouns in their speech. For example, they report something and say, that guy, um, he was thinking that, and then the brothers and sisters weren't very... They could go on for hours and still not express themselves clearly, stuttering and stammering, not making any sense, saying things that have no connection to each other, leaving you none the wiser after hearing it, and anxious, even. In fact, they have read many books and are well-educated. So why are they incapable of uttering a complete sentence? This is a problem of disposition. People are so slippery that it takes great effort to say anything. There is no focus to anything they say. There is always a start, but no end. After opening their mouths and blurting out the beginning, they swallow down the end. Why do they swallow it? Because they don't want you to understand what they mean. They want you to guess. If they tell you directly, you'll realize what they're saying and see right through them, won't you? They don't want that. What do they want? They want you to guess on your own, and they are happy to let you believe what you guess is true. In that case, they didn't say it, so they don't bear any responsibility. Beyond that, what do they gain when you tell them your guess at what their meaning is? Your guess is exactly what they want to hear and it tells them your ideas and views on the matter. From there, they can speak selectively, choosing what to say and what not to say, and how to say it, and then take the next step in their plan. Every sentence ends with a trap, and as you listen to them, if you keep asking follow-up questions, you will have completely fallen into the trap. Is it tiring for them to always speak like this? This is their disposition. They don't feel tired. It's completely natural for them. Why do they want to create these traps for you? Because they can't see your views clearly, and they fear that you will see through them. At the same time, they are trying to stop you from understanding them. They are trying to understand you. They want to elicit your views, ideas, and methods out of you. If they succeed, then their traps have worked. Some people stall by often saying, hmm, and ha. They don't express a specific point of view. Others stall by saying, like, and well, covering up what they're really thinking using this in place of what they actually want to say. There are many useless function words, adverbs, and auxiliary verbs in every sentence. If you were to record their words, 
you would discover that none of them reveal their views or attitudes on the matter. All of their words contain hidden traps, tests, and temptations. What is this disposition? Evil. Very evil. Is there duplicity involved? These traps, tests, and temptations they create are called duplicity. This is a common characteristic of people with the evil essence of antichrists. How does this common characteristic manifest? They report the good news, but not the bad. They exclusively speak in pleasing terms. They speak haltingly. They partially hide their true meaning. They speak confusingly. They speak vaguely. And their words carry tests. All of these things are traps, and all of them are means of duplicity. Amen. Amen. God tells us that antichrists never speak directly, and their words are ambiguous that they always test the waters, trying to entrap others, to achieve their personal goals, without taking any responsibility themselves. It is just like when Satan told Eve that she wouldn't really die if she ate that fruit. Satan's words were full of testing and temptation. Yes. Not directly revealing its goals, but leading others to sin without it having responsibility. It's just like God has said, Everyone has within them the disposition of Satan and harbors Satan's poisons to test God and seduce man. Sometimes when people speak, they speak in the tones of Satan with the intention of tempting and seducing. Their thoughts and ideas are full of Satan's poison. The very manner they bear is a thing of Satan. Sometimes just a simple wink or gesture reeks of temptation and seduction. Hmm. I was the same, always speaking in a roundabout way, spying and tempting with my own vile motives. When the supervisor mentioned that new believer, who I had some ideas about, had been going to other gatherings and not mine, I wanted to use that chance to get rid of him, for I didn't want to spend my time supporting him. But I didn't want the supervisor to know that I delimited him. To maintain my image, of being responsible and loving to newcomers, I cagely suggested to her that we should consider his feelings and do what he wanted, trying to lead her to suggest he be transferred to those gatherings so I could achieve my own aims. The way I was speaking was just what God describes. If you were to record every word they speak, you would then discover that none of them reveal their true perspectives or their attitudes on the matter. All of their words contain hidden traps, tests, and temptations. What is this disposition? Evil, very evil. <sighs> Not a single honest word came out of my mouth in those situations, but all those misleading things came straight out. I saw I really did have an evil nature. I preferred beating around the bush, not letting people see my true face. I thought it would be dumb to say some things directly. I'd be shooting myself in the foot, and only fools would do that. I had mistaken being crafty for being clever, and thought I was skilled, had a sharp mind, and was always one step ahead. So this way my interests wouldn't suffer. I made being crafty my personal principle and a way of life, and completely disregarded the positive things God tells us about being honest people who are frank in word and deed. I felt I'd be at a disadvantage. I was way too shrewd and saw things in a twisted way, seeing satanic rules for life as my own personal standards, always being slippery and ready to cheat and play games. This realization left me feeling kind of afraid, seeing how crafty and evil I was. I saw I really was corrupted and was less than human. As I was reflecting on this, all sorts of memories came flooding back. One time, 
I had really liked a designer handbag my aunt bought. I didn't want to spend money on it and was embarrassed to ask for it. So I said, pretending to be sweet, this bag here, you're not even using it. What a waste. You've got a lot of that brand. Why did you buy this one? The reason why I was speaking to my aunt with this tone was that she'd think I was being caring and didn't want her wasting her money. But what I really meant was that she had no personal use for that bag, so it was just wasted on her. She responded, I bought it because it looked nice and was on sale. I like this brand, but you know what? You can have this one if you want. With just a few words, just like that, I got her to offer that bag to me. I was always like that. I wouldn't directly say what I wanted, but got others to infer it, then offer it to me. Looking back on all that, I didn't know how cunning I could be. I really wished I could turn back time and never have said such bad things. At that point, I realized that the way antichrists speak and act and their evil disposition I had in spades, as described by God. I'd been that way all those years, sometimes without really thinking about it. Something crafty just came out of my mouth. I really did have an evil disposition of antichrists. It'd be really dangerous if I didn't address it. You're right. Before I used to think that speaking in a roundabout way was just being cunning, but I didn't realize that behind that sort of thing is an evil disposition. Yes. It is. It's great that you learned from God's words just how serious your problem was. That's right. That's right. How did you practice and enter in after that? Later, I read another passage. Mm. Hmm. Let me read it. Great. That God asks for people to be honest proves that he loathes deceitful people and has no liking for them. God's dislike of them is a dislike of the way they do things, their dispositions, their motives, and their methods of deceit. God dislikes all of these things. If deceitful people can accept the truth, admit their deceitful dispositions, and can accept God's salvation, they too have a hope of being saved, for God treats all equally and the truth treats all people equally. And so, if we wish to become those who are beloved of God, the first thing we must do is change the principles of our being. No more can we live by Satan's philosophies or get by on lies and deceit. We must leave behind all lies and become honest. And in this way, God's view of us will change. Before, people always relied on lies, pretense, and tricks to live among others using Satan's philosophies as the existential basis, as their life and foundation by which they conducted themselves. This was something that God despised. Among unbelievers, if you tell the truth and practice honesty, you'll be slandered and rejected. So you follow worldly trends and Satan's philosophies. You become more and more skilled at telling lies and become more deceitful. You also learn to use insidious means to achieve goals and protect yourself, you become more prosperous in Satan's world and thus sink ever deeper into sin and can't extricate yourself. Things are precisely the opposite in God's house. The more you lie and play tricks, the more God's chosen people will tire of you and reject you. If you refuse to repent and still cling to Satan's philosophies and logic and use conspiracies and advanced schemes to disguise and package yourself, you'll likely be revealed and cast out. It's because God hates the deceitful. Only the honest can prosper in God's house. And deceitful people will eventually be rejected and cast out. It's preordained by God. Only honest people can have a share in the kingdom of heaven. If you don't try to be honest or experience and practice in the direction of pursuing truth, if you don't expose your ugliness, don't show your true face. You'll never receive the Holy Spirit's work and God's praise. Amen. 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 Reading this, I understood 
that God likes honest people and dislikes craftiness. Only honest people can gain his salvation, while crafty ones will be exposed and eliminated. Exactly. During my years of faith, I've seen of those who were kicked out of the church. Some were always muddling through and dishonest in their duties. And some were always being fake in an effort to maintain their status, always testifying to themselves. They'd be devious and cunning to achieve their own goals. And they would temporarily take in some people. But God sees everything, so he'd set up situations to expose them. Yes. When I was cultivating and watering new believers, I'd find excuses to play games and be deceptive, to cover up my corruption. And I didn't seek change, which led to more and more transgressions that could only end up with me cast out by God. Hmm. And looking at those brothers and sisters who were honest, in their duties there were plenty they didn't understand, and they had oversights. But they didn't divest themselves of responsibility to protect their status, or think about things impacting their own interests. They considered how to learn the truth and grasp principles to do their duties well. And as a result, they gained God's enlightenment and guidance. Yeah. They might have had average caliber, even been a little ignorant, or even had problems in their duty. But God would still guide them and help them gradually learn principles of the truth, experience God's leadership, and grow in life day by day. Mm. Exactly. You're right. God blesses those who are simple and honest. That's His righteousness. Yes. yes. It is. Then I realized that telling the truth, being honest, and having people see me clearly isn't a bad thing. True. It may be a little embarrassing at the time, but I'd feel good about it, and God likes it. Plus, brothers and sisters never look down on me when I'm open about my problems. Right. They help me with them and lead me to enter into the principles. And that kind of practice won't do any harm in my duty. It's a wonderful thing. It really yes. is. But I played games, delimited new believers. Instead of working to cultivate them, I was looking for any excuse to stop them from doing their duty. I shirked my responsibility by playing tricks and I avoided criticism, and even saved some face. Yet my corruption and problems in my duty remained unresolved, and the progress in our watering work suffered. God's kingdom gospel is expanding so quickly now and need many new believers to spread it. But I hardly cultivated any new believers. So wasn't I working as Satan's minion, standing in the way of God's work? I'd been working against God. I thought of God's words. The more you lie and play tricks, the more God's chosen people will tire of you and reject you. And deceitful people will eventually be rejected and cast out. It's preordained by God. Only honest people can have a share in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. God's words are so clear to me. Whatever path one chooses, the person they seek to be, is directly related to their fate. Hmm. Right. God set up all these situations, large and small, but I just carelessly ran through them, without seeking truth or self-reflecting, living by my satanic nature. I didn't even enter into the most basic truth of being honest, or make any changes in my life dispositions. I remained to be Satan's minion. How could I be saved that way? Living as an honest person is the only right path. Yes. In the secular world, those who go with the flow and who are slick and who can see which way the wind blows are admired by others. But such people can't stand firm in God's house. Right. Mm -hmm. God hates those who are crafty and loves those who are honest. Mm -hmm. You must be honest to have a human likeness and be safe from Satan. Mm. Yes. Being honest is so important. It, it is. is. A lot of the time, we don't directly tell lies but we have our own motives and tricks in what we say. And mm. that's even worse than lying, mm. which is why we really must reflect on that or we'll never be honest people. That's mm. right. True. Well, I kept seeking the truth on this after that and gained clarity on the path to becoming an honest person. Mm. Let's watch a video about it. Great. Mm -hmm. 
Almighty God says, when people engage in deceit, what intentions stem from this? And what is the aim? Without exception, it is in order to gain status and prestige. In a nutshell, it is for the sake of their own interests. And what lies at the root of the pursuit of interests? It is that people see their own interests as being more important than everything else. They engage in deceit in order to benefit themselves, and their deceitful dispositions are thereby revealed. How should this problem be resolved? They must accept the truth. Only when people understand the truth can they see through to the essence of their own interests. Only then can they learn to relinquish, forsake, and be able to endure the pain of letting go of that which they love so much. And when you can do so and forsake your own interests, you will feel more at ease and more at peace in your heart. And in so doing, you will prevail over the flesh. If you cling to your interests and are not in the least bit accepting of the truth, if in your heart you say, what's wrong with seeking my own interests and refusing to suffer any loss? God hasn't punished me, and what can people do to me? Then no one will do anything to you. But if this is your faith in God, you will ultimately fail to gain the truth and the life, which will be a huge loss for you. You cannot be saved. Is there any greater regret? This is what ultimately comes from pursuing your own interests. If people only pursue status and prestige, if they only pursue their own interests, then they will never gain the truth and the life, and they will be the ones who suffer loss. God saves those who pursue the truth. If you do not accept the truth, and if you are incapable of reflecting upon and knowing your own corrupt disposition, then you will not truly repent and will have no entry into life. Accepting the truth and knowing yourself is the path to your life's growth and to salvation. It is the chance for you to come before God, to accept God's scrutiny, and to accept the judgment and chastisement of God and gain the life and the truth. If you give up on pursuing the truth for the sake of pursuing status and prestige and your own interests, this is tantamount to giving up on the opportunity of receiving God's judgment and chastisement and attaining salvation. You choose to pursue status and prestige and your own interests, but what you give up is the truth, and what you lose is the life and the chance to be saved. Which means more? If you choose your own interests and forsake the truth, are you not stupid? To put it bluntly, this is a great loss for a small advantage. Prestige, status, money, and interests, these are all ephemeral, whereas the truth and the life are eternal and immutable. If people resolve their corrupt disposition of pursuing status and prestige, then they have hope of attaining salvation. Moreover, the truth people gain is eternal. Satan cannot take it away from them, nor can anyone else. You have relinquished your interests, but what you have gained are the truth and salvation. These results belong to you. You gain them for yourself. If people choose to practice the truth, then even if they have lost their interests, they are gaining God's salvation and eternal life. 
those people are the smartest ones. If people benefit at the expense of the truth, then what they lose are life and God's salvation. Those people are the stupidest. As for what a person ultimately will choose, interests or the truth, this reveals a person more than any other. There are often motivations behind people's lies, but some lies don't have any motivation, nor are they deliberately planned, but come out naturally. Just what kind of lies can be avoided? First, resolve the ones that are easy to avoid. Then seek the truth to overcome the hardest ones, the lies that are hard to fix. Practicing in this way, will it not be easy to rid yourself of lies? Easy to solve the problem of lying? For instance, you feel these words contain motivations, that they are tainted, that they are lies. You are aware of this as you're speaking, right? If you are, first keep quiet. Pray to God in your heart and think things over. Take the matter before God to include in your prayers and lay bare. First, put this into practice. After doing so for a while, you should pray to God again and seek, asking that He discipline and reproach you if you ever lie again, after which you should gradually bring your lies before your brothers and sisters to be dissected. In this way, bit by bit, your lies will become ever fewer. Today, you'll tell ten lies. Tomorrow, you might tell nine. The day after that, you will say eight, after which you'll only say two or three. You'll tell the truth more and more. Being honest, you'll come closer to God's will, His requirements, and His standards evermore. And how good that will be! To practice being honest, you must have a path, and you must have an aim. First, resolve the problem of speaking lies. You must know the essence behind your speaking these lies. You must dissect what motives drive you to speak these lies why you are possessed of such motivations, and what the essence of them is. If you carry on putting this into practice, there will surely be an outcome. One day you'll say, it's easy being honest. Being deceitful is so tiring. I don't want to be deceitful ever again. There's too much going on in my heart and my mind always has to think things over. I always have to think what to say to trick people, to bluff my way through. I always have to think over these things. My words can't be too light-hearted, but neither can they be too solemn. And in my heart, I'm unable to bear this pressure. I don't want to live like this ever again. Living like this is too exhausting. At this time, you'll have hope of being truly honest, and it proves that you have begun to make progress toward being honest. This is a breakthrough. Of course, there may be some of you who, at the start, after speaking honest words and laying bare yourselves, will feel, it was mortifying. My face went red. It was so embarrassing. When you meet others, you think to yourself, others find out the secret things I did and the lies I told to trick them. How shameful this is. I used to think I was all right and that I gave people a good impression. But now that I have dissected and exposed myself, no one thinks I'm any good. What do I do? You have to pray about this before God, saying, God, I want to be honest. 
Today I'm putting being honest into practice. I beg you to let me enter more deeply. I beg you to allow me to put aside my pride and allow me to not be governed and constrained by these deceitful motivations. I want to live in the light. I don't want to live under Satan's domain and be constrained by Satan. I don't want to be bridled, controlled, constrained by the corrupt satanic disposition, or to even be harmed by it. When you pray in this way, there will be ever more brightness within your heart, and you will say to yourself, it's good to put this into practice. Today I have put the truth into practice. I feel that only now am I living as a real person. And as you pray like this, has God not enlightened you? God has begun to work in your heart. He has touched you allowing you to appreciate how it feels to be a real person. This is how the truth must be put into practice. At the very start, you have no path, but through seeking the truth, you find a path. When people begin seeking the truth, they don't necessarily have faith. Not having a path is hard for people. But once they understand the truth and have a path to practice, their hearts find enjoyment. If they are able to practice the truth and act according to principle, their hearts will find comfort and they will gain release and freedom. Amen. After reading this, I could see that to be honest, we must let go of personal interests. That's something very important. It really yes. is. The goal behind lying is to protect your own interests and achieve your aims. And when people pursue that kind of thing, controlled by their satanic disposition, they'll lie and play tricks. So it's critical to let go of personal interests, which makes it easier to resolve being cunning. Yes, yes. it is. Also, it's important to self-reflect often and consciously practice telling the truth and being honest to allow God to inspect our every word and action. When we want to be crafty in what we say or do, we must then ask ourselves what it is we're trying to achieve. And if it is something cunning or something evil expressing itself, we have to pray to God and turn back right away, learn to open up to others, to reveal our thoughts, perspectives, as well as corruption and faults and seek the truth to resolve them. That's the only way a crafty, evil, satanic disposition can gradually change. Hmm. Hmm. Afterwards, I opened up to my supervisor about my opinions on newcomers, admitted my underhanded motives, and apologized to her. I was really surprised that she didn't look down on me and instead discussed some problems in our duties with me. It made me feel good after doing that. I stopped being secretive, and I felt really at peace. Great. Thanks be to God. It's so important to be an honest person, to resolve being cunning. Yes, yes, it is. Though I'm not entirely free of my crafty, evil, satanic disposition, I have the faith and will to be an honest person who brings God joy, mm -hmm. to focus on being honest and accepting God's scrutiny in every single thing I do in my life. That's how I'll be. Thank Thanks God. be to God. Thank God. God. 